1969, a group of astronauts changed the world. They walked on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1972, our journey ended. We've never been back. 2010 begins a year of change. Private companies are working on next generation spaceships. Governments are looking to go back to the moon and on to Mars. It's time to look up and dream again. It's time to push humans into the cosmos. It's time to educate and engage the planet. It's time for Space Vidcast. for Friday, April 9th, 2010. We are Benjamin and Carrie and Higginbotham. We are your Space Vidcasters, and this is going to be an awesome show. We've got uh, Loretta, oh, the world's longest name. R Loretta Hidalgo, do it for me. Really? It's yeah, Loretta yeah. Hidalgo Whiteside. Thank you. Thank I can't do names. We've learned this. We've learned this. Yeah, it's Space really Vidcast. sad that your name is Higginbotham and you can't do names. It kind of is. Well, I okay. can do Higginbotham. That's pretty much that's it. it. Uh, and she was doing a nice little dance during the introduction. It was pretty she, awesome. It was pretty awesome. We're gonna have to see if we can make her do that dance again <laughs> in post show because it was. Uh, we started giggling actually as we're watching because we've got her like right here. If you're wondering why we have so many computers sitting out here, I mean, there's like a computer here, there's a computer here, there's a computer here. There are two down there, and of course, I've got my iPad. The reason is we are doing a global webcast for Yuri's Night coming up this weekend. Yes. And it's gonna start at. According to this podcast, it's tomorrow. According, yes, according <laughs> to the on-demand recording of this, it will begin tomorrow. And it's going to be at 1800 hours coordinated universal time all the way into the next day at 0600 hours coordinated universal mm -hmm. time. And that's 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time until 2 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time yes. that following Sunday. That's going to be a 12-hour global podcast for Yuri's Night. And we're going to be bouncing from time zone to time zone and showing some pre-recorded videos. And we're going to be going and showing some really, really awesome stuff. We do have a quick little snippet of one of the South Pole videos that we'll be showing. So, so cool. here you go. This is just one minute of what we're going to be showing during the global webcast. Check this out. Hi, my name is Mel McMahon, and I'm the station manager here at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station for the winter of 2010. It's an absolute honor for me to be able to kick off Yuri's Night for 2010 here at the bottom of the world. Um, I wasn't around when Yuri made that first flight, and I still hadn't been born when we first set foot on the moon either, but at the age of five, I had a basic understanding of what we were doing when we set the first shuttle up. And since then, the image of that shuttle has stood as a symbol to me for what we can accomplish when we put our minds to it, and personally as inspiration for all my own travels and adventures, which eventually took me down here. So our guest tonight is Loretta Hidalgo Whitesides. And you can say it. I can, I can. Loretta is a huge space advocate, a consultant, and former astrobiologist who has worked with in the Canadian Arctic doing research with NASA at the bottom of the ocean with director James Cameron. Awesome, and, by the way. I know, and has accumulated over four hours, and I do think that numbers might be a little bit off, of weightless time as a flight director for Zero Gravity Corp. Uh, she's done some work with the XPRIZE Foundation, as well as written for Wired Magazine. Loretta is also the co-creator and executive director of Yuri's Night, an annual worldwide party in celebration of space that was established in 2001. Her passion is obviously connecting people with each other, their dreams, and Spaceship Earth. So, welcome, Loretta, to Space Vidcast. Thank you. And Spaceship Earth, before we continue, our chat is frozen. Could you unfreeze the chat? Oh, me? sad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, 
you know, we brought you on obviously because I mean, co co creator and executive director uh, director of Yuri's Night, which is you know, for those who don't know, we we did this huge Yuri's Night thing last year. We had a lot of fun with that, and then we saw you at ISDC uh, 2009, and mm -hmm. you did a Yuri's presentation that you were very passionate about, and you seem like the obvious person to bring on the show right before Yuri's Night. So tell us a little about what is Yuri's Night. Uh, Yuri's Night is a open source global celebration of space exploration. We started in 2001. It's, it, fa it falls around April 12th every year, which is the anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight, first human space flight, mm -hmm. and the first space shuttle flight, which was April 12th, 1981, 20 years later to the day. And we just take that opportunity to get the world together, which was Yuri's request to celebrate space and really look at um, the future we want to create for humankind. And how did all this start? Um, Other than Yuri uh, going into space. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it was basically an idea. Sorry. Seat adjustment here. It was basically an idea that I had in the 90s um, after working at Johnson Space Center and, and figuring out this coincidence. And uh, I brought it to uh, Vienna in 1999 uh, where I was at a, a UN space conference with a, a bunch of some of the my still coolest friends from around the planet and where I met George, my husband, in fact. Aww. And uh, they, they took the idea and ran with it, came up with the name, made, you know, came up with the idea of having it be distributed around the planet because basically they said, well, we want to do this in our countries too. And so um, we, that's what we did and we ran with it. And um, we kicked off the first Yuri's Night two years later in 2001. That's awesome. That, for the 40th is... anniversary and the 20th anniversary. And it's such, an, it's a, such a good year. It's such a, like a good space year too. Exactly. Because <laughs> you have I to think about 2001 go by without a space party. Exactly. <laughs> so you have to like 2001 space party, and now we're up to 2010 space party. Weird. Both <laughs> movies Another wrapped movie. into one. Perfect. And it's our tenth year because it's the first year, the second year, third year, the tenth year. You know, the yeah. math is even easy to do. You're so good. <laughs> so we're excited. It's a lot of fun. I bet. I, I thought you were taking the next. Oh, I'm that, sorry. I thought that's what the tap was. No. But apparently not, which is why Did we I have Did I tap this, you? Yeah, that's why we have the awkward I'm silence. I'm sorry. Because I, I got the cue of, I have the next question. I didn't mean to tap you. But uh, she didn't have this. I'll so. sit over here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll kind of get back to yours night a little bit, because we do. you definitely want to cover that. Uh, not just be the parties are all, all around the world, and they truly are all around the entire planet, which is awesome. Uh, but let's go back into what you talked about in the intro. Uh, you've done some amazing things like diving to the bottom of the ocean. And I'll just say, I, you know, I'm a space advocate and I think we should explore space. But I'm not just about space exploration. We need to understand our own planet as well, including our own oceans. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me a little bit about that diving to the bottom of the ocean? Because that just sounds really cool. Absolutely. It was 2003 and I got invited to be on an expedition with... Uh, Titanic and now Avatar director James Cameron mm -hmm. and uh, basically after filming the movie Titanic where they dive the wreck of Titanic in Russian submersibles he fell in love with the idea of doing these ocean missions mm -hmm. and so we, he wanted to do a space movie and so he was looking for astrobiologists to take with him and uh, I happily volunteered and it was an ex extraordinary experience we did um, I did five dives to the sea floor we were doing about Titanic depths on most of the dives which is my deepest dive was 3,519 meters, which is over two miles down underwater. Um, and uh, we did a month, at, a month at sea in the Atlantic and a month at sea in the Pacific, um, and uh, five dives between the two oceans. It was unbelievable, just the, the experience of being that far off the grid, that far away from 911. Um, it was really exploration. It was real, and really getting a sense of uh, what a water planet we live on when you haven't seen land for a month. Yeah, and I bet. What got you started in that? What made you think I want to go do some ocean stuff now? <laughs> well, it, uh, like a lot of things in my life, I owe it to uh, my mentor at JPL, Michael Eastwood. Um, he knew James Cameron because he'd invited him as a speaker, and when so when Cameron was looking for scientists to take with him. Uh, he called Michael Eastwood, and uh, Michael, you know, contacted a number of uh, folks he knew around JPL. I was in grad school uh, at the time, doing astrobiology, and 
and thought this would just be the, a really extraordinary opportunity. You know, what better training for Mars than, than to be at sea and diving to, you know, extreme depths, you know, for a month. That's very cool. Okay, so Ben's curious about the water. I'm curious about the Arctic. Yeah. <laughs> we live in Minnesota, so we're familiar with cold. <laughs> <laughs> so that always, what it's like. Right, that always intrigues me. And, you know, and we just played this, was that the South Pole, the Yuri's Night mm -hmm. Toast? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so tell me how you got involved in that, because I'm really curious. That South Pole video, by the way, was so cool. Oh, yeah. I just love that. Actually, um, before we go into that, how did you get the video back from the South Pole? Cause Carrier you, pigeon. Yeah, exactly. How, how did you get that <laughs> back up here? That's all Ryan Kobrick. He's um, uh, our pr uh, special project manager for um, all of our global podcasts. He's doing an incredible job. He set all that up. I, I, I'm assuming they use some sort of intertubes uh, technology for that. Um, but uh, for details, you'd have to ask Ryan. Okay, I'm sorry. Back to Carrie Ann's question. Um, the Arctic stuff. So I was working at NASA Ames at the time mm -hmm. uh, with Dr. Chris McKay, who's amazing, mm -hmm. and uh, was hanging out with Pascal Lee and those guys, and they were planning their um, expedition to Houghton Crater. And um, I, I uh, basically asked my boss if I could go with them. Um, and they were they needed a, 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 a biologist to help um, uh, Charlie Coquel work with the extreme life, the plant life in the Arctic. And I said, oh, I, I can do that. And so um, I got sent up there um, for two weeks in, uh, in, in June, July, and it was incredible. Like the 24 hours of sunlight. I don't know how many hours of sunlight you get in Minnesota, but About 24 four. hours of sunlight no, in, in the middle of the summer. <laughs> um, but uh, 24 hours of sunlight is intoxicating. It's just, there's nothing cooler, especially for taking photographs, there's nothing cooler than mm -hmm. being out on your ATVs doing your uh, traverses and having, you know, like eight hours of golden hour to right. take your photographs in, it's just beautiful. So explain the, so for those viewers who maybe are younger viewers or who don't know, explain the 24 hours of sunlight and why that happens at the two poles. So basically is this, <laughs> physics, so basically as this earth goes around the sun on an axis during the northern hemisphere summer, it'll be tilted towards the sun. So as it's rotating around, it, it never goes into, sh above the, um, Arctic Circle, you can get 24 hours of sunlight um, because it's you never get you're just always facing the sun. The sun will just go around in a circle in the sky, um, and it's it's just incredible. And then it's the same reason why it gets dark the other. Time. I was going to say, and then the uh, the other flip side of the coin is that you could get up to or you get 24 hours of night, uh, which would be not as picturesque, I assume. Yeah, that's that's really tough. That's why I was so moved by those South Pole guys because they they signed up to win her over, and that's that's some serious duty. And I just found out Ryan's space was in the Arctic as well. Really? Yeah, I had no idea. Oh. Like his time up there. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. And yeah, Ryan of... also got to participate in the Hot Mars project. Oh, very cool. I had no idea. I'm learning new things about our own viewers every day. Oh yeah. Uh, Ryan, Ryan's all comes all kinds of adventures. So let's head back over to uh, Yuri's if we could, because Yuri's is just going to be awesome and epic this year. Uh, how many how many parties have you already got as of this recording? As of this recording, well done, Ben. Uh, we're at 179 events in 62 countries. Oh my God, that's and crazy. If I want to attend a Yuri's party, what do I need to do to either attend or let's just say, you know what, uh, last minute I Wait, want to start. Wait, are we a party. talking you? Or like the average viewer? Not me, because okay. I'm going to be hosting a global webcast. I'm just but asking. But what about uh, anyone else who's who's doing that? How, how do they attend a party or start a party? If you go to our website, www.yuriesnight.com, uh, sorry, .net, um, you can get a list of all the parties around the world. Just click on party list or use the interactive map of the Earth at night. Um, and you can also click start a party if you wanted to uh, say, hey, there's no party here in uh, Minnesota. I'm going to start one. And what can I expect as a goer of, because every party is different, right? I mean, you've got giant parties and then very, very small intimate parties as well. So how, how, how can I tell what kind of party I'm getting to? Or can't I? Is that just some of the excitement? I mean, maybe I'll have 10 people. Maybe there'll be 10,000. I have no idea. It does vary. A lot of the events uh, that have registered on the website have uh, snippets of information about what they're planning. So you can get a sense of uh, what it'll be like before you go or a link to their website. Um, and it, all of them have the email address of the host. You could always email them if they don't have any publicly posted information for more, more news. 
And of course, they can come here, let's just say for some whatever reason there may be, they can't attend a party in person. Or if they just want to be really cool, they can come right here to spacevidcast.com. Yeah, for a split second, I was like, no, 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 we're not allowing people in here. We're allowing people <laughs> into the studio. They can just Fine call calf. Cop calf, uh, <laughs> but you can watch the global webcast. So uh, now I could talk about the global webcast, but I think you know just about as much as I do because um, we've I, never done it before. Exactly. Okay. So uh, can you describe a little bit of what people might be able to expect on the global webcast? <laughs> um, well, let's see. We're going to have well, what, one of the things I'm really excited about is we've got Richard Garriott, uh, who's the son of Skylab astronaut Owen Garriott and a famous video game designer and private astronaut of his own right, flew on the Russian Soyuz in 2008 to spend 10 days on the International Space Station, which is very cool. And, he, and as we discussed this afternoon, um, he's definitely made it because he was on the Colbert Report app. Um, That's right. That's awesome. And he's going to, yeah, he's going to be our keynote speaker out here at NASA Ames on uh, Saturday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And we're uh, going to be feeding that webcast into Space Vidcast, into the global webcast. So that's one thing you can see if you come to the webcast, um, as well as links from the Cocoa Beach party, the NASA Goddard party, the New York party, um, as, and the party in Spain um, of students from all over Europe who get together. Uh, for their CANSAT competition um, and uh, a, n a number of other events. I think Turkey signed up for this, for the, to link into the webcast um, and other events around the planet. And how did you get all the different NASA research or just the different NASA centers involved in this? Because some of the biggest parties are at those NASA centers. <laughs> well, that all started with uh, General Pete Warden, who's the center director here at NASA Ames. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's an extraordinary guy. Basically, he came up to me and he said, Loretta, you know, I think we need to have a Yuri's Night party out here in our hangar at NASA Ames. <laughs> and uh, I said, that sounds like a great idea, Pete. And uh, true to his word, he's uh, hosted, this will be his third time hosting Yuri's Night in one of his hangars. And they just keep getting uh, bigger and more impressive. Awesome. And I, I think all the other centers, of course, saw what he was doing and were like, oh, man, it's not fair. We want to do it, too. And there had been grassroots parties at, in Houston from, you know, from 2001, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the Outpost and things like that. Um, and Cocoa Beach has been doing parties for a long time. But um, really, when Pete got involved, the other centers started to, like, get interested in what, was ha what their young professionals were organizing grassroots in their own cities and started getting interested in helping them out and participating. And how do you think Yuri's Night helps reach uh, people who maybe aren't necessarily interested in space? Or do you? I mean, if, I'm, if I'm just a non-space geek, is Yuri something that will help get me inspired about space? Absolutely. One of my favorite things about Yuri's Night is how inclusive it is. Uh, you know, that it allows you know, artists and musicians who got inspired by the same images that we did as kids, whether it was Apollo footage or Star Wars movies. Um, and they just took a different path. They expressed their passion you know, and took a different major. Um, but they still love it just the same way. And we give them an opportunity to, to, to plug back in and get connected with space as well. And I think having that allows all the public to have space be more accessible to anybody and have them come away feeling excited and connected and inspired by space. And, and along those same lines, what, what's some way for young people or uh, for someone who's currently not involved in space to get involved in space? Uh, well, definitely I would start with coming to a Yuri's Night event or watching the Space Vidcast. Um, uh -huh. And then one of the... Yeah. Yes. Well played. <laughs> well played. And two points. <laughs> um, and then after the party, you know, to stay involved, there's, there's, place, there's web, great websites like um, Space Hack that allow you to, mm -hmm. you know, look at different ways that you can get involved, even from your own, you know, computer terminal. Um, things like, you know, study at home that, you know, and all the projects that have come, you know, after that, that allow you to, you know, analyze real NASA data or, you know, do, do mashups of different space videos or just get involved and be participating yourself. And how did you actually get involved? I mean, wh where, where did you become a space geek at? Geek at? <laughs> geek S? What would be the proper? I think geek is just all geek? inclusive. Okay. It's how how yeah. did you become a space geek? She's good. Um, I've been a space geek for as long as I can remember. Um, I, I mean, I, in as, as far back as kindergarten, I remember there was a, a astronaut and a on the bulletin board on walking on the moon. And if you got all your 
alphabet right, you get your picture in the face mask, and I just remember being like, oh, man, I want that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it stems back, you know, from playing Spaceship Under the Stairs with my cousins and, and reading um, Na National Geographic's Our Universe, which is a fantastic picture book mm -hmm. that we had at my cousin's house that we would, uh, you know, look through all the time, and it's just phenomenal. I think we must have been six or something. Wow. So if I may, just kind of from my perspective really quickly, when you're growing up and you're seeing these astronauts and the majority of them are men, right? I mean, we didn't have women astronauts for a bit, as it were. I mean, how do you stay motivated as a female in the space industry? Does that make sense? I hear you. Um, I, 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 I'm lucky in that I was born when I was, mm -hmm. because I think it was a lot harder earlier. And I think a lot of things have been hard won. Uh, opportunities have been hard won that I get to benefit from. Um, you know, when I was growing up, there was a woman on every space mission. You know, it's like, right. I mean, it wasn't always that way, but I wasn't old enough to understand it. You know, by the time I was old enough, it was sort of normal. Okay. And, and so f for me, I've never had being a woman as like a, a setback. You know, it's always to me, you know, been an advantage, you know, it means that I'm even more unique, you know, at a conference I stand out more, I'm more memorable, um, and I, I think it's it's an asset, really, and I, I'm really excited when I meet other women in space and interested in space and uh, encouraging other women to go into space, and I love, you know, the, the NASA folks are always talking about how they want to get more women involved, and it's really exciting to be able to tell them, you know, well, you know, in our, in our community, in our generation, and Yuri's night, you know, we have about like 30% women and uh, mm -hmm. they're always like, really? And you're like, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you track a different set, I guess. Along the um, same lines. Oh, go, go ahead. Uh, no, no. Well, I just, okay. you mentioned NASA and how NASA's always kind of surprised to hear that kind of stuff. I mean, you, do you feel that Yuri's Night is kind of, maybe not Yuri's Night specifically, but that new space in general and that this generation is having kind of more of an impact in that, on NASA and that younger, more vibrant, and more females are getting more interested in NASA? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. I think all that's helping. And I think just in general, you know, young, you know, women are just being raised now with a sense that they can do anything and they can go anywhere and they can be anything. And they don't, they don't even have that, you know, anyone telling them that they can't anymore. Well, best case scenario. Right. And I think that's really starting to show up even in the engineering classrooms and science classrooms of the country. Awesome. That makes me happy. Uh, so speaking of classrooms, do you think NASA is still cool enough to attract today's kids? I mean, do you think they're going to be able to continue to do that? Or do you think that they're just, you know, they become a giant bureaucracy, bu bu again, can't speak. Bureaucracy? Bu bureaucracy. <laughs> Thanks for the save on that one, Carrie Ann. No problem. And uh, uh, people, you know, <laughs> students today, or at least kids, just kind of look at NASA and go, yeah, government agency, I don't want to do that. I want to work for a SpaceX instead. That's one of the biggest challenges facing NASA right now is how to stay relevant and how to really be an exciting place for young people. Um, and I think that's something they should really look at and they're sort of, you know, guiding posts for where to go from here. Um, there's a big opportunity to really look at how do we stay relevant, how do we be on the cutting edge, how do we be working on really exciting new technologies that young people will want to work on. Otherwise, we're going to lose them all to Google. <laughs> well. Yeah, I mean, possibly, especially since the tech sector is so hot right now. I mean, do you, it used to be that the space sector was the, the big, huge, hot thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, personal computing came along, the interwebs came along, the Googles, and you could become a multimillionaire by doing the tech stuff. And then space just kind of seemed to linger. Is there anything we can do to solve that? Or are we just kind of, is new space the solution? Is NASA the solution or a combination thereof? My hope is that it's a combination thereof. Um, new space is definitely awesome. It's definitely capturing a lot of imaginations, which has been fantastic. And really, I think what's exciting about it is that it's really capturing the um, pop culture. You know, you're seeing it on Colbert, you're seeing it on TV, you're seeing it in magazines and in Wired. Um, and that really makes a difference. Um, and But really, when NASA do great is when they're sort of tagging into that and and you know, looking for what's exciting and how to, how to be a part of that and really caring. 
you know, what I, I mentioned the Google, and I'm, I, I don't, I don't want to the Google. You can only call them the Google. Yes, I know. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound like they're big evil or anything. Like they're do, that's not it. In fact, they're actually part of the Google Lunar X Prize. Right. Uh, and so they are trying to get into space too, and I think they're trying to inspire people in space. And I believe you were part of the X Prize Foundation as well, weren't you? At one time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It was worked with Peter during uh, 2004 when we were uh, getting ready for the events around the uh, Bert Rattan's launches. It's a very exciting time. So the Ansari X Prize. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, we were out in Santa Monica, California, and um, we basically the they had we had 10 million dollars to give away to the first privately funded com company that could uh, launch a suborbital rocket. That capable of carrying three people and do it twice within two weeks, and uh, that money was going to run out on uh, December thirty first, two thousand four, and uh, so we were really uh, riding it close, hoping that somebody pulled it off in time that we could actually write that check uh, for ten million dollars. Luckily, um, the, the Mojave Aerospace Ventures and Scaled Composites team uh, pulled it together right October fourth at their launch. Um, and we were able to do some really cool events that year, um, letting the public come out and watch the first private uh, human space flight. And out of that, though, was born Virgin Galactic, essentially. Well, it's not entirely true. Virgin Galactic was around before then, but that, that's what made it into a real entity that has vehicles now, Spaceship 2, White Knight 2. So, you know, the, there's real stuff coming out of that, and I think people are starting to get inspired with that. So it's possible that organizations like the XPRIZE Foundation, and then, you know, as we mentioned, some of the cool stuff that NASA can do, and even some of the cool stuff that New Space can do, uh, can be kind of that motivational thing for students and for anyone trying to get back into space. Um, at least that's my hope, and, you know, combine that with kick-butt parties like Yuri's night, and you got a, you got a winning solution, I think. Imagine dancing sounds, in zero-G. Oh, that sounds great. In <laughs> fact, I just saw a, a video Richard Garriott filmed in space of trying to dance in zero-G. Very entertaining. <laughs> uh, what do you think the most valuable lesson some young space enthusiasts can learn? I really, big words are eluding me tonight, but uh, what do you think some of those valuable lessons uh, are that they could learn? I think the biggest message we have is to dream big, um, really do outrageous, bold, unbelievable things. I mean, that's what Peter did when he said, I'm going to raise $10 million to, for the first suborbital spacecraft. And at the time, that was a ridiculous, audacious thing to say, especially since he didn't have any money in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with Yuri's Night, we said we were going to start a world space holiday that's going to be celebrated 10,000 years in the future. Um, but it really takes, like, you know, pointing over the fence and saying, you know, I'm going to hit the ball over there and mm -hmm. saying some really big goal that's exciting enough to keep you inspired. And what's crazy is uh, it's actually possible to do it. So, you know, my, my message to everybody out there is to think of something crazy and outrageous that inspires the heck out of you and start making it happen. Why not? Who's doing that right now, in your opinion? Who's the biggest dreamer out there in the, the industry today? Well, Peter, clearly, it's, it's hard for anyone to even keep up with him. I mean, I try, but there's, it's just, I don't have a chance. You have to just carry I mean, case the Red Bull with you everywhere you go with Yeah, him. yeah, I mean, you got... <laughs> Started SED, started Space Gen, started ISU, started X Prize. You know, it's hard. You know, but but that's what you know. That's driven a lot of things. I mean, so many of us in a, in the Yuri's Night community are the beneficiaries of that. You know, the conference that we started Yuri's Night at, you know, came from work Peter had done. You know, ISU. A lot of us went to. You know, just we're all you know SED's kids. You know, all of us are sort of still reaping the benefits of his crazy dreams and um, I hope that we I can provide that for a new generation and I hope that generation can can provide it for the one after them so when Yuri's night is all done where can people find you online to get in touch with you say Twitter and whatnot uh, you can follow me on Twitter is Loretta Y Hidalgo H-I-D-A-L-G-O um, or on Facebook um, and you can always uh, Find me on email as well, Loretta at yurisnight.net. The email, the Facebook, and the Twitter. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the right, the awesome. big three. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're excited to do, do the global webcast, and, and thank you for inviting us to do that. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be uh, 12 hours of awesome. And by the way, 
Uh, am I allowed to mention what was uh, mailed to us? Absolutely. Okay, great. There are going to be some freaking amazing <laughs> giveaways during this entire global webcast. We have got uh, from Think Geek a um, uh, one of the. Well, we've got a bunch of things, so we'll start small. Because you don't want to be like, we've got this! Oh, and we have these other stuff too. Okay, all right, fair enough. So we but have. I, we got this big, very cool thing! Shush! For a second. We have. I'm not going to give it away, I'm just going to keep it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. It's, it's going to be really <laughs> terrible. We, yeah, from Think Geek, we have uh, these little mini lightsaber laser pointers and their keychains. And they're all uh, the Darth Vader variation, because I found out that there's different variations. So these are little red ones, and so you can kind of pretend and mm -hmm. like freak out the cat. Mm hmm. So we've got a bunch of those. And then we have two of the, what they're called is personal soundtrack uh, t-shirts. So there's like just a, uh, um, a speaker in the middle there and it comes with a little pad and you can pick your different like themes. And so of course there's like the Darth Vader theme and then there's like, I'm, I'm so excited, that kind of stuff. I mean, there's just like a whole bunch of them. And I just found this out today because there was somebody I saw who has one. Mm -hmm. You can also plug in your iPod and play stuff Play stuff from your iPod on your chest, I guess, is if that's a... Anyway, so there's that. There's two of those. And then... According to Rissick? Yeah. I'm not sure how to say it. You can actually add your own sounds, too. Yeah, you can add your yeah. own... Yeah, okay. exactly. And then... And then... Oh, is this the big one? Yeah. The really cool, awesome lightsaber. Not the cheap, chinky, dorky ones you get no, at Target no, no, no. that are like... Like the really cool Think Geek lightsaber. These are like the metal handle replicas, which is really funny yeah. to say replica because the, they don't really exist. The hundred dollar plus lightsaber. The right. one that you're like, hmm, hard to justify buying, but if I got it in a giveaway, you would be the like part <laughs> of my premier collection. Right. I put it like with my sword collection in one of the like Pretty samurai much. sword lightsaber. Right. One of those. And this is this is the blue version. It's Obi Wan from episodes four, five and six. Not the Obi Wan version from episodes one, two, and three. Not nearly that. The, I just the good no, 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 no. I want to be very specific because I mean, if you go online and you look at thinking, there's like twenty of them, and so I want you to know which one I'm speaking about. That's the one. That's just a few of the things we're giving away. We're also giving away copies of Space Vidcast Epic, which is up to a hundred dollar uh, value. We're also giving away um, some Yuri's wares, as they were, that mm -hmm. actually have the big. Uh, you're not. We need, I'm not wearing it. I've got a different year. Is night. Loretta's on. wearing it, but it's kind of it's it's hard to say. Well, we'll I have a pin on. Yeah. She, yeah. All right. Yeah. So you, 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 hold. It doesn't matter. You, you, there you go. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, we've got Yuri's wares that will be giving away tons and tons of stuff. We have got fantastic interviews. We have from twelve some, hours to fill, people. Oh yeah. So we need you here because we don't know what to do. <laughs> oh, so it lights up. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It's like your own personal rave party. <laughs> that was the dance she, That's was, what doing. she was doing. That's what she was doing. We rolled the open and she's sitting there dead and we're like, we're looking at, we're like trying we're not trying to laugh. We're trying to laugh. And if you listen to the open, you can actually hear us going. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> So all of that's coming up starting oh. at um, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Yeah, or that's uh, 1800 hours coordinated universal time this coming Saturday. It's going to be awesome. And for those of you uh, who are watching this on demand, this coming Saturday is April 10th. So that's, that's when we're going to start the whole thing. And uh, we'll be going into April 11th. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're excited to, uh, we're excited to do that. Uh, uh, Loretta, stay with us. We're going to come back to you in post-show and uh, talk to you a little bit more about Yuri's and some of the cool stuff that you are doing there. And for everyone else, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to see you live this weekend for Yuri's global webcast where we bounce around time zones, bringing in awesome parties from all around the world, as well as uh, awesome interviews from some really cool people. I don't, I mean... It's going to be awesome. These are big names that are going to be brought onto the show. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. There's things we can't tell you yet. I'm it's, sorry. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Yeah. I just got to tell you, it won't be hard to fill that 12 hours. So no. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. We'll see you this weekend as well as next week. Oh, and next week's guest, which I always forget to do. i got to get in the habit of doing I know, this. I know. Also from Apogee Books. Uh, and thank you to Apogee for making this happen. It's John Powell, who is the author of Floating to Space. I would like to float to space. I want to go there. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you next week. We'll see you this weekend.